So we will start with the basic medication safety course, uh, history and how we started and all these uh, things. So can we move to the next slide, Mr. Mikeen? There. Yeah. Excellent. So as you can see, this is uh, the National Guard Hospital. Um, 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 VMS course was started since uh, 2000. Uh, uh, the, the idea of medication safety program and medication safety center was started since 2007, um, 2006. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please, uh, Michael? OK, uh, click. So in US, uh, there are 44,000 to 98,000 preventable deaths every year. I mean, imagine there is a medical errors um, uh, with this huge numbers every year. And um, uh, if you want to convert these numbers to, um, uh, to the best uh, system uh, in the world, which is aviation, you will uh, see that it means 106 Boeing 747-400 um, crashed, which means crashing two planes uh, uh, in a week. So imagine uh, uh, every year, every week, we have two crashed um, uh, planes, uh, uh, which is, uh, I think, all of us, we are not going to travel or uh, we are not going to uh, use the airplane and we are going to use the uh, walking or the car uh, to avoid using the aviation. So this number, this 44,000 to 98,000 is a very huge number, very critical number. Um, um, it is uh, very dangerous if we really have this uh, number of uh, uh, harm events every year. Move please to the next slide, uh, Michael. This is only to share a statistic. This is a very old statistic, 2000. And uh, as you know, um, although we are doing uh, some uh, improvements, some uh, changes in the system, but still we are facing a uh, uh, problem. Uh, move to the next uh, slide. So this is how uh, this one explained the previous uh, uh, slide, how many airplanes uh, crashed um, if you convert the medical errors to uh, crash, uh, crashing uh, airplane crashed. Next slide, please. So the Institute of Medicine estimate bub, uh, bub, uh, published uh, 2000 uh, was based on 1984 data, uh, 1984 data. The basis of the estimated is uh, nearly uh, three decades old and updated estimate is developed from uh, modern study publishing. Yes, Ms. Susan. 2008 to 2011. What's the figure um, at about? If Susan, your life, you can uh, go ahead and uh, finish. Okay. So, uh, 440,000 preventable deaths yearly um, due to medical error in US. So, this is an estimate number and this is the source of information. Can you move, uh, Mike? Again, we would like to share with you a statistic. So, uh, previous, previous slide. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, happened. Okay. So, no, 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 Michael, not this one. Let's go up. Could you use? More? Yes. So chance of being harmed in the aircraft now is one in 1,500,000. Uh, uh, but the chance to be, to, for being harmed in the hospital, imagine one harm every four patients admission. So this is a very huge number, very close number and very dangerous if we would leave it like that. We have to work on it, okay? So uh, NGHA JCI accreditation came on 2006, November. 
And after that, when they spoke about medication events and medication error, the CEO decided to have um, the medication safety program uh, since uh, January 2007. So the idea of uh, MSP or medication safety program started from January 2007. Can you move that please, uh, Michael? So what is the guy or what are the guidelines of VMS course? Uh, certification is mandatory for all healthcare providers involved in medication use process. So anyone involved in medication use process, physicians, pharmacists, nurses, um, uh, RT, uh, respiratory therapist, they have to be certified uh, from the BMS course, the one we are taking now. Um, this uh, a BMS course uh, approved by Saudi Commission for Health Specialists, and there are uh, same many hours, I think four hours, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, it's four hours. Four hours. So, and the certification that you will, uh, inshallah, pass after the passing the exam and the certification that you will have it, it will be valid for two years. Uh, to present the certification and the course is paid uh, by the organization. You don't pay anything and even the staff, they don't pay anything. Um, can we move to the next, uh, Michael? There is a question, by the way, I can hear here. Uh, could you please talk about the exam? Uh, Mr. Michael, at the end of the session, will uh, give you more detail about the exam. Okay, so going back to the presentation goals of BMS course, why we are doing the BMS course? Why don't we leave people to come and see and try? Uh, this BMS, uh, BMS course will enhance the knowledge uh, for the healthcare providers about medication safety. Um, you will uh, face in the uh, uh, presentations, follower, uh, following presentations, uh, something about the allergy, something about lookalike, something about the safeguard, about reporting. So we are trying in this course to cover every single um, angle of uh, medication safety. And here we are promoting safe medication practice. And we are also talking about the just culture uh, for reporting and managing medication errors. Can you um, move? Uh, we will talk about the just culture in the following presentation. So basic medication safety course was started um, uh, on January 2008. A proposal uh, was made to the Institute of Safe Medication Practice in US to, for establishing the BMS course. And the course was started for the nurses. Uh, on June uh, 29, 2008, uh, first BMS certification course for nurses was done. And on June 30, 2008, first Saudi International Medication Safety Conference was held. Next, Michael, please. This is the starting team who start uh, doing the BMS course. Um, move, please, Mike. And uh, in May 2009, the Institute for Safe Medication and Practice has endorsed this program on basic medication safety. And you can, uh, if you go to the International Medication Safety Network, can you go to the next slide? September 2010 was initially. What is the uh, International Medication Safety Network? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, a meeting done uh, internationally every year in a different country, and as you can see. Um, uh, 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 from 2007, it was started um, till 2015. This uh, was not updated. It should be updated because there are following uh, some um, um, uh, courses was held and uh, the International Medication Safety Network was uh, uh, discussed uh, during 2016, 17 and 18. Last year, there was also uh, one uh, international uh, meeting. Um, can you please uh, move the mic? And if you go to the link, if you um, just uh, type in the Google IMSN, you will see, as you can see here on the top, uh, the flag of Saudi Arabia. And the presentation of basic medication safety course is uploaded there. Uh, so uh, every country can use it and uh, present it to their um, hospitals. 
So we are proud of our team that uh, we reach up to this level. Can you move uh, Michael, please? So this is the end of the presentation. It's only a history about medication safety. Uh, when it was started, about the course itself, and uh, about our work and efforts that it reached internationally. I think, uh, Michael, there is um, a video. Uh, Michael will connect you with a video now. We want you to see this uh, video. Then we will talk later about it, Mike. Yes. So this is a video for uh, Beyond Blame. I don't think anybody would have suspected this little child on that given day coming in for very elective surgery, a very healthy child, would not leave the hospital alive. We take them very personally when we make a mistake that we failed. Uh, the system didn't fail us, we failed it. How could I miss that order? How could I dispense that? Ben was a little boy that was scheduled for elective ear surgery. Unfortunately, when the surgeon went to inject what he thought uh, was lidocaine with dilute epinephrine, he ended up injecting uh, concentrated 1 to 1,000 epinephrine. When we started doing CPR and the child did not come right back, I began to feel, I don't want to say a sense of panic, but a sense of dread. I think everybody in that room felt like they were trying to swallow a basketball. You just, it was, it was really difficult to see a child just before your very eyes die. I had a patient who was uh, going very bad on me. So I called her doctor and he told me to give her 40 milligrams of Lasix IV push. I took the medications to the bedside, which is not a usual occurrence, but because my patient was so ill, I wanted to be with her. I had not completed giving the medicine, and when she did um, seem to expire, I thought it was because of her condition. I was doing CPR on the lady when uh, another nurse in the room held up the potassium chloride um, bottle and asked what it was doing in the room. And I said, oh my God, that must be what I made. There was a night, they referred to it as a night of many codes. There was. Uh four codes in the hospital, codes meaning emergencies where the people need to be resuscitated. And there was a possibility that these four patients might have been given a drug in error. And uh, since oh, the the medications were dispensed on my tour, their IV medications, uh, your, you. I reported it and took the responsibility. Yes. One patient died two days later, You're another kidding. patient died about a month later, and the other two patients survived. When a nurse, physician, or pharmacist makes a medication error uh, and uh, it becomes public knowledge, the people who work around them don't trust them as much. And the person who has made this mistake might never regain their reputation. What's clear in a 10-year study that we've undertaken here, uh, over 200,000 patients, medication errors and adverse drug events are occurring all the time. The rate of medication errors here is surprisingly high and has been in healthcare for as long as we've been studying it. As many as seven per 100 hospital admissions contain some serious or potentially serious medication error. That's a rate of error that's uh, far larger than in other industries which try to control hazard as well. What went through my mind at that time was, um, this is it, you know, this is, this is it. I finally made a mistake. I mean, you worry constantly that you will, and I figured that this was it. Then I was advised to hire a lawyer and defend my license. I was extremely emotionally upset. Um, it took me years to actually become able to talk about it as I am now without becoming physically ill. When I realized that uh, 
the the error yeah. was my responsibility. It was yes. total devastation. It's, it's the yeah. biggest nightmare yeah. to hurt somebody. And I got a call yeah. from a contact of mine at another VA hospital, and he advised me to go immediately and resign because they were going to fire me that afternoon. Yes. The word had been passed down from on high that uh, that I was not to be hired under any circumstances. So <clears throat> then I was I was really out in the cold. Yeah, the surgeon and I went and sat down with the mother who was alone at the time. And uh, it was uh, a really terrible situation. Uh, the mother was really in denial that anything could have happened to her little boy. It was about two weeks before Christmas. Yes, we can show And uh, we kept telling her that he was in a coma and might not wake up. And, and she kept wondering when she was going to be able to give him a present. She just bought him. And it was, I won't forget it anytime soon. When Dr. McLean and I went down to meet with the Cole family at their attorney's office, mm -hmm. I explained to them how the procedure was done, how the medicines were used in the procedure, how we had saved the syringes, analyzed the contents, yes. and how we had made the error, and that we took full responsibility for that error. We reached a settlement that evening and afterwards, Mr. Kolb sent for me to come in by myself to the family. And he stood up and put his arms around me and he thanked me on behalf of his family because he said not knowing had been the hardest part. Now that they knew what happened, they could begin to try to deal with it and to move forward. The standard thing when there's a mistake made in our society is the stonewall and people hide behind denials uh, lawyers uh, etc whether it's in politics medicine and business nobody wants to be accountable for their actions it's got to be somebody else's yes. fault or they don't remember what happened and yes. they they hide what happened we were very I forthright with family and we said look your son got the wrong drug we are responsible and then you do the what can we do to help you I don't care if you're the best nurse, pharmacist, doctor, it doesn't matter. Of course you're going to make errors, you're human. I think the fact that people say the error that could happen to them is one of the biggest problems that we have. Good people give potassium intravenously by mistake as a direct injection. Good people dispense paralyzing agents instead of an antibiotic. It could happen to any one of us given the right set of circumstances. And when we look at it, 10, 20 different things, 20 different system elements had to go wrong in order for one of these cases to actually happen. Before the change, we really looked at errors very isolated. So if errors occurred in the nursing department, the nursing folks yep. really looked at what happened and made changes within their own system. If they happened in the pharmacy, the pharmacy department really was responsible for um, analyzing the error and making a recommendation. And medicine did the same. So it was very isolated and each department did their own yep. thing. We really realized that we need to communicate and all the disciplines need to look at all the errors. What happened in the Denny Dunn case was primarily a packaging issue. For a number of years, the hospital had been using uh, an antibiotic known as metronidazole, which was foil wrapped uh, without any knowledge of the pharmacists or the pharmacy staff. Uh, uh, a new medication was brought in called uh, uh, Mivacurium, which is a paralyzing agent, a neuromuscular blocker, and it was in identical packaging. And neither the packaging had real clear information about what the drugs actually were. The names weren't visible. That assured that an accident or error was going to happen. The only thing was who was going to be the unlucky one, and uh, and that by fate was me. Yes. Yes. People will say, "Why didn't you catch it?" The point is, we should have all been working to catch it before it got to the patient. We wire errors into systems because of the way we configure the work and the the pattern of work. We all know that the medication. Uh, system is very complicated. It has many interacting parts and handoffs and people and it's usually not one person that's involved in an error and it's important for us to realize that and look at uh, the system as a whole. There are things that we could do with technology for example, barcoding, computerization of physician order entry, prescriber order entry. Um, I think that in many cases the errors that we've seen wouldn't be able to happen. So wherever a drug is ordered, the computer is right there to intercept the order and make any changes. Wherever a drug is administered by the pharmacist or the nurse, the computer is right there to provide another level of check. Taking advantage of modern information systems, modern computer support systems, to be able to detect 
and uh, intercept errors and support human decision making in ways such that errors uh, don't occur. I think that now we're looking at things as other industries have and looking at our whole system and that when we have a medication error, it's not one person, um, it's really the whole system. Leaders in healthcare are waking up and realizing that they've got to lead the system-wide efforts to reduce errors. It's not something that they can delegate. It's got to be leadership that says we're going we're gonna to do away with error. This was a healthy child that should have walked out and enjoyed Christmas. Now, I will bet any dollar that I have that this has happened before multiple times, uh, same type uh, of scenario, <laughs> and I bet it's going to happen again. But until we educate people and do the preventive action, we're still going to lose lives. Uh, uh, and what we want to do here is we want we to have Ben's death have some meaning, and that is to try and prevent this happening, this tragedy to another family. Okay, I'll call it now. Okay. Hi, Yad. Okay, so uh, we're live online now again. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. I hope you can hear me. Uh, now we are after the video. We are going to do, to uh, tackle the topic for overview of medication error with uh, Mr. Iyad Farah. Okay, uh, let's go. One moment, one moment. Hope you can hear me. Uh, now we are after the video. You can talk now. Uh, okay, Mike, uh, good afternoon. Mike, and everybody. Uh, one more thing. Uh, you know that we have some technical difficulties. Uh, 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 Mike, uh, yeah, the voice is not clear. The voice is very far. I cannot hear. It's, it's not clear. I don't know, attendee. Are you hearing the voice of Mr. Iyad? But I hear you very well. Yes. Uh. Attendee, do you hear voice of Mr. Iyad? Can you please reply in the chat box? Uh, 
that and the other thing, if you hear me, shall I start with the overview or go to Lhasa? What oh, I I can't follow. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it's sounding uh, very weak. Um, maybe five minutes. Mike, I can start the overview until you fix the issue with Mr. Iyad, OK? Iyad, okay. I will start the overview until uh, Mike uh, fix the issue with you. All right. OK. Attendee, do you hear my voice? Please, anyone can reply in the chat box. Marlene, can you close the door, please? Attendee. Um, Mike, I don't see any reply from the attendee. Do you see anything? Anyone can it, uh, hear uh, my voice? My name is Ghadam. So you hear my voice. Ghadam, you can, you, you can hear my voice, not uh, Iyad. Huh? Yes, okay, excellent. Um, okay, excellent. Um, good luck, everyone, inshallah, for this uh, course. And uh, sorry for what uh, happened, but uh, inshallah, we, you will do a great job. And we're sure that you are uh, committed and uh, you can understand everything. Um, if you have any question about the um, uh, introduction, just send me in the um, um, chat box. OK, excellent. All of you answered. OK, excellent. So uh, if there is no question, I'll give you one minute only to ask. If there is no question, I will start um, uh, the overview. Okay, so it looks like there is no questions. I'm going down. We hear you, doctor. Okay, excellent. Um, let me start with the uh, second presentation, which is the overview of medication errors. Um, we need to give you an overview about medication errors. We need to explain to you what is medication errors, what is medication events. You will hear this uh, terminology. We will share with you some terminology, some definitions. Uh, so, uh, Michael, please, uh, next slide so I can uh, start. Next. So what are our uh, learning uh, objectives uh, today? Uh, we are going to identify human factors associated with medication errors. Um, and you will hear this one when inshallah you work in uh, the pharmacy, you will hear a lot about um, human factors. And uh, we are going to explain to you what is the concept of just culture. Uh, what is just culture? What's the difference between just culture and other cultures? We will review and uh, definitions related to medication safety, and uh, we will discuss the impact of latent failure on medication safety. And this latent failure mainly appears whenever we investigate a medication event. OK, so move please, uh, Mike. Um, you can see this picture. And this is, I think, uh, usually happen uh, by the male. Female, we don't do any mistakes during driving. Um, this could happen, and it happens. I uh, can remember one of our colleagues, he did this one. He was in hurry while it was still uh, filled the benzene. He just drove his car. And uh, this is what we call human errors. His brain was diverted. He was thinking about something else, and he go ahead and uh, drive the car. And uh, there is um, an Institute of Medicine. They published an um, article about two error is human. This error is related to human. It, it's not intentional. Most of the errors that happens, it's not intentional. Uh, it happens because uh, our brain di diverted somewhere else. 
we're thinking about something else. Um, we are loaded. Um, uh, there is uh, the other stage did not double check properly due to some factors. So this error to, is a human uh, was uh, publishing the a uh, huge number that you saw in the first presentation about medication events and uh, medication uh, occurred at that days and um, uh, how they converted to. I would really recommend every one of you just up in the Google Google it to air is a human. It will show to you the whole article. It's a very short, small, concise article and talk about human errors. Can you please move uh, Mike? So uh, I again move, yeah. So occupational injuries cause 6,000 deaths per year and 7,000 deaths yearly caused by medication errors. Imagine you are here in the hospital to help your patients to give the right medication at the right time, but unfortunately you failed and you give the wrong medication and you cause death to the patient. So this is very dangerous and this is very critical and you can see the reference for this information was published in the Institute of Medicine uh, on 1999. Move please. OK, so there are two uh, myths uh, uh, about human factors. The first one, which is the perfection myth, and you can see it in the left side. You see this man, how perfect is he? He wants the grass to be at the same level. And he, he, yani if you try to very hard uh, to not do medication error and I'm perfect um, or my staff should be perfect. They should not do any mistake. They should come from the morning till uh, end of the shift doing no errors, no mistakes, no delay. And this is very uh, difficult myth. Do you think uh, audience anyone can answer me? Uh, do you think that we can be 100 percent perfect? Uh, not doing any mistakes or errors. Do you think that? Anyone can answer, please. Do you agree that we can be perfect and do no errors? I would like to see in the chat box. Do you agree that you should be a perfect and do no errors? Yeah, excellent. So Ahmed answered. He said, no, we cannot be perfect. Error could happen. OK, and I'm going to punish you, Ahmed, if you are not perfect. If you did the mistake during the uh, shift, I will punish you. Do you think this punishment is going to help and you will not repeat the mistake again in the future? What do you think? Ahmed, anyone can answer. No one can be perfect. Excellent. So you're with me. That's great. OK, so do you agree with me? I will punish you so you will not repeat the error. No, OK, human do a mistake. Excellent, excellent. That's enough. So punishment will not help. Perfect is not a true myth. OK, move uh, Michael, please to the next presentation. People are really um, with us and I'm happy that we have this group of uh, pharmacists. OK, so let me explain to you the type of error. We have an unsafe action. Error happen, OK? This unsafe actions, unintended actions, you have the right idea, but the action was wrongly done. Example, you know that the dose is one gram. OK, but by mistake, you type a 10 gram. OK, so you you know you have the right idea, but there is slips and slabs in the system. OK, system was slow when you type it and you try to delete it. Uh, it didn't delete the zero, for example, or the system uh, allow you to enter a huge uh, those for vancomycin, for example. So this slips and slaps errors is in performance of a scale based behavior typically occur 
when attention is diverted. And يعني غالبا الerrors هذه تصير لما your attention somewhere else. For example, you are having this order for vancomycin. <clears throat> you want to enter one gram and the technician called you. So you turn around to the technician and she asks you about something 10 gram of IV immunoglobulin. Then you answer her and by mistake you go back to your keyboards and then you enter 10 gram. Okay. And even it happens for physicians frequently. They said most of the errors, when you talk to them, they said um, at that time the nurse divert my uh, thinking to somewhere else. For example, he wants to order one gram and then she talked to him about something else, 10 milligram, and by mistake he put 10 uh, instead of one milligram. So this is the first part, part on the top. Now let's go to the second part, which is intended actions. How is intended? Are we here in the hospital to do an intended errors? No, of course not. So this is what we call it either mistakes or violation. How? Mistakes like wrong idea. You have a wrong idea. For example, uh, your colleague told you the dosing and you did not get it properly. This is Dr. Siraj Marlene. So this wrong idea rules knowledge based errors arise when situation is misinterpreted. It's done. OK, OK. I will stay online. OK, uh, Michael, this is Dr. Siraj. He will uh, try from home uh, to connect from home. OK, so let's go back. These mistakes um, that you have a wrong idea. For example, the rule is not clear. And the rule, uh, it's written in a different language or it's in English, but it's in a, a difficult English to be understandable. So you misinterpret it, misunderstand it, um, or um, you think that uh, the rules is saying uh, that you can do this A, B, C, but you um, uh, misunderstand it that I can do A, C, B, for example. So there is a problem in the uh, policy or in the procedure written. Um, uh, so this is what we call mistakes. Violation, this is the breaking of the rule. And breaking the rule, this is intentionally. I don't want to give one gram. I um, intentionally want to give 10 gram. OK, errors resulting from intended deviation from accepted standards. I know I have to uh, dispense it within 30 minutes, the stat order, but I don't want to dispense it within 30 minutes for a reason. Uh, or some people uh, you can hear uh, especially for <clears throat> the multinational uh, in the nursing or uh, multinational in uh, uh, yeah because nursing we have multinational not like us uh, we are from the same country rarely you find pharmacists from other country so they say um, back home we do this one like that back home we do no you should just follow your hospital policies rules and procedures can you move uh, Michael So I think you can press again, Michael. Yes. So there are three behaviors. As a conclusion for the previous slide, we have three behaviors. Human error, OK, which is product of our current system design. The problem is the system design. OK, um, uh, the problem is um, uh, they put you as a pharmacist covering one satellite pharmacy, a very busy satellite ph pharmacy covering 300 beds. You're alone, uh, so this is considered as environmental problem. Or, for example, um, uh, you are a pharmacist who's working in, um, let's say, cardiology. All of a sudden, they ask you to cover in oncology. So this is training, lacking of training. Uh, or um, our policies and procedures are not clear. So this is, in this case, when we have a human error mistakes, we console the uh, staff. At-risk behaviors is the second behavior. What is at risk behavior? A choice, risk believed, insignificant. For example, um, I'm in the shift. I know that the dose is uh, not properly entered in the system, but I will give the correct dose just to help the patient and to be fast and not to delay the patient. Okay, and it happens. I know it's wrong in the system, but I'm giving the right dose. 
but you don't know the nurse maybe she will go back to the system and read the order in the system so this is at risk behavior you choose to do the error you know there is a problem but you choose to do the error and this is in this case we coach train them to not to do the error again the reckless behavior as i mentioned i know the policy i know the procedures but i will not follow it okay and it's unjustifiable risk in this case we should we can use the punitive action move so there is a case that we use a punitive action okay move uh, mike so again we have um uh, stop mike please we have uh, different cultures punitive cultures before 1990s they were using the punitive uh, culture and this punitive culture frontline workers were afraid to report their own errors and for example now in our hospital you can hear your colleague he did error, error or mistakes and he reports the error he's the one who did the error and it happens and the system was changed so this is not considered as punitive culture before the punitive culture when they uh, punish people they put the يعني, uh, file people will not uh, report events correct and uh, will not learn from error we will not share the error correct um, uh, so this is will not help the system to be improved then after met or by the mid of 1990s they change it to the blame free culture and uh, like for example uh, if you have brothers or kids at home and you say uh, i want to go uh, for dinner tonight uh, do whatever you want to do what will happen to your house can anyone answer if you have a kid and you give them the green light to do whatever they they want to do what will happen to your house again let me repeat you want to go to a dinner and you ask the kids at home either brothers sisters or uh, your kids and you will tell them you're free and you can do whatever you can do what will they will do what do, how, how do you think the house will be when you come back from dinner any answer please any answer please anyone so at that time uh, they decided not to blame okay you are free the problem is the system you did not you are not involved in the problem so i have answer here the house will turn into a real mess they will continue to make mistakes excellent they will continue to make mistakes going to destroy the house yeah excellent all your answers are perfect and uh, excellent and this is what will happen if i will tell you um listen you're free any error you will do um, um we will not uh, encounter you and you will not be uh, committed on this error and this is wrong okay um so going to the uh just let me answer yeah yes so in this um uh, by the mid of 19th they changed to blame no blame culture and this is unsafe people start to do unsafe acts and uh, they fail to tackle uh, the individuals who make the unsafe act so what we should do can you please move uh, michael now the just culture just culture comes from justice we have to be balanced okay you should not be punitive 100 percent you should not be blame 100 percent you be you should be justice just culture and this is the new culture and this is the culture that national guard are adapting okay uh, recognize that a human are imperfect uh, staff are encouraged uh, for reporting and you can see when you come inshallah for rotations as in turn uh you will uh, Mar marley can you please check yeah farah he's downstairs bring him uh 
Iyad Farah, you know Iyad Farah? Malish, because Iyad will come present from my uh, uh, office. So justice uh, or just culture, uh, we are encouraging people to report and the top reporter always we uh, um, uh, we give a gift or a certificate that we have this top reporter uh, for the medication events. Um, uh, people are uh, accountable, uh, high insight into system based causes. Uh, when we do analysis for any events, we look at the system, people, uh, um, all medication use process. We don't uh, finger point in someone and we don't ignore uh, anything. We look at the system from A to Z and we are using the just culture um, concepts. Move, uh, Michael. So if there is any adverse drug events happen, which is the big umbrella of medication events, it's adverse drug events. It is classified into adverse drug reaction, which is like uh, side effects, allergy, um, kidney injury due to medication, and uh, medication error. Medication error is like, for example, delay, dose incorrect, um, dose extra, um, uh, dose omitted, uh, this medication error classified into near misses, close call, and I want you to pay uh, very high attention on clear, uh, near misses close call. You have exam at the end of the day. Uh, maybe you will have this one as a question. And actual medication error. Near misses close call from the name, it means it didn't reach the patient, okay? It was stopped at the medication use process, either uh, during prescribing or dispensing or administering. Actual medication errors, it means it is really reached the patient. Um, excellent, thank you, Michael. So what is the definition of adverse drug events? Always people, they don't like uh, definitions because uh, we cannot uh, remember uh, the definitions, but I want you just to understand that adverse drug events and injury from drug related intervention. You give a drug, there is an injury, okay? Adverse drug reaction responds to medical or the, to medicine, uh, noxious and intended. You give a medicine, okay, with the normal doses for the normal diagnosis for this disease, but you can see a reaction to this drug. Like for example, this drug is given to this indication, but what happened? We have an adverse uh, uh, drug reaction, acute renal failure. This is an example. So adverse drug reaction, I'm a normal person um, with a normal, uh, only I'm, I'm sick and you give me um, antibiotics, then I am uh, reacted to this drug. This is adverse drug reaction. I'm a normal person taking this drug, then I have seizure when I take this drug, because this is adverse drug reaction. Yes. Now move from Michael. So medication errors, uh, as a definition, medication error reverse refers to any preventable events that may cause or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm. Yani, you give medication, you delayed the medica giving the medication to the nurse, she delayed give it to the uh, patient and it caused um, harm to the patient, for example, or you dispense medication and the packaging was look alike to other package and you will face it a lot in the pharmacy practice in the future. So this is the definition of medication errors. Can you move uh, Michael, please? Near misses or close call, as I told you, please pay attention on this definition. Any event happen, it didn't reach the patient. It was stopped before it reached the patient during prescribing, dispensing or administering or even the patient himself stop you and uh, tell you that this is not my drug or this is an overdose, I've never taken this drug. So you should listen to the patient because always we say patient is the last independent double check, okay? Another definition which is hazardous situation refers to circumstances. For example, the dose is correct, everything is correct, but the system uh, building this dose in a way that is very hazardous, maybe a physician in the future will uh, do uh, improper dosing or hazardous situation like you're in the pharmacy and you look at the packages you want to dispense, then you discover that there is a lookalike medication and this might uh, cause a harm in the future or error. So this is what we call it hazardous situation. Defective medicine, a medicine, a vague medicine. 
it's, it's, it, it doesn't have the quality, the proper quality of this drug. And this is what we call it a defective medicine. Move, Michael, please. OK, um, I, I want you to pay attention on latent failure. You have exam at the end of the day, OK? And there is a question on latent failure. Refer to less apparent failures. Now, when there is an error happen, OK? And you investigate why this error happened. You cannot say this is a pharmacist who did the error and this is a pharmacy mistake or this is a nurse who did the error. It's a mistake of the nurse or the physician. No, it's a multifactorial. Sometimes when you dig further and do a further investigation, you will find there are something we call it environmental factor. طيب, why you did not put the right number? Because there was a noise. I have a printer behind me. The pharmacy technician come call me. The nurse came to the window. So there is a noise. Or, for example, the system down when I go back to enter the order, um, I forget, for example. Or uh, the policy, I go back to policy. I read the policy. I'm sure I read the policy and I follow the policy, but the policy was written in a very complex way that it's not understandable. Okay? So the best way to avoid all these is the ice bar. Ice bar, you will hear it when you, inshallah, working in the pharmacy, which is uh, identification, situation, background, assessment, recommendation. And this is when, when you want to finish your shift and the other shift will start. They are using this ice bar format uh, as a communication uh, between the first shift and the second shift for special cases. Uh, move, Michael. OK, you can see this picture. How complicated is this one? This is in the ICU. Um, uh, it was taken from one of the ICU patients. You can see how many drugs the patient's on. And this is a very risky situation. So you are in the pharmacy or in the uh, patient care area or anywhere here in the hospital. We are really uh, under risk and uh, risk around us. So we need to be really careful when we deal with medications. Move, Michael, please. Now, uh, this is uh, to share with you errors in medication use process. As I told you, there's something called medication use process, starting from purchasing the drug, uh, uh, put it in the shelf, prescribing, transcribing, dispensing, administering the drug. And um, here they just summarize it in four stages, main stages, which is prescribing, transcribing, dispensing, and administering. You can see the highest potential for harm is prescribing, OK? But where is the highest error not intercepted? In which stage? Can anyone answer, please? Now, I'm telling you that the highest potential for harm is prescribing, which is 63 per, per 100 patients. Bed. My question, where is the highest Errors not intercepted and it reached the patient. In which stage? I have question here. In case of latent failure, we can't specifically say whose fault was that was that right? In any errors, we don't say this is the fault of X or Y or Z. We are looking at the event from A to Z. We are looking at the event from all stages, from purchasing till the end. And during each analysis, we dig further to see the root cause of events, and you can see that this is a latent failure. Like, for example, uh, as I told you, uh, the light was not clear, the, uh, the policy was complex. So you list it, you don't finger point in anyone. So anyone can answer what is the highest percentage? I will move or you will answer. Excellent. During administration, all of you, not dispensing. You can see dispensing 0.28, but it is administration, which is the last stage uh, uh, before the medication reach the patient. OK, so high incidence of adverse drug events due to medication administration errors justify the need uh, to target interventions to prevent these errors in hospital settings. Move, Michael. 
So um, there is something called the Swiss cheese model. And uh, as, as you can see in this um, uh, cheese, there is a hole, the Swiss cheese, there is a hole. Um, imagine the medication use process, it's like a layer, prescribing, dispensing, administering, it's like a layer. And each layer has hole. We don't have 100% perfect system, perfect, perfect system. Okay, so if the error happen in the first layer, which is prescribing, and it passed the prescribing, then it was stopped by far, uh, dispensing, which is good. So the error will not reach the patient. But if it passed the prescribing, dispensing, there is another layer, which is the administering. If it's stopped by the administering or nursing, this is good, so it will not reach the patient. But if it passes all holes and it reaches the patient, here the adverse drug events will happen. Okay, so we need to be very careful. If we identify this hole, we need really to block these holes to prevent events. And mainly these holes due to these latent failures, such as lack of training, poor lightening, the temperature, fatigue and stress. Uh, so this is mainly uh, due to this latent failure. Can you move, uh, Michael? There is something called verbal and telephone order. There is verbal, you are in emergency situation. Physician call, give me this drug or this epinephrine. This is the verbal. Telephone, call the physician by phone. So do we have a policy for that? Do we have a standardized procedure? Yes. Why standardize the verbal and telephone order? As you can see here uh, uh, in National Guard, especially we have more than 50 different nationality. And when you work and when you answer the phone, you can hear different accents. Okay, that's why we standardize the policy of verbal and telephone order. The other thing is the short memory. Uh, for example, uh, somebody will call, I will tell him give 10 gram. If I don't write it repeated or read back, uh, the, uh, I might forget it. And this is what happens sometimes. We call our colleague where, from where you buy this thing and they tell you the shop. Then when you close, oh my God, I forgot what the shop they told us. So we have unfortunately this uh, short memory. So when do you take the telephone order? Let's now uh, concentrate on the telephone order, okay? Because usually you are in the pharmacy, they will call you by phone. It's an emergent and urgent situation. And it's not only for you pharmacy guys, also for nursing, they are taking a telephone order for uh, from physician. Urgent situation like a prescriber, um, he's uh, scrubbed, he's in the OR, so he give you a telephone order. Can you move, Michael? Okay, so the te telephone order procedure, first nurse, will record, for example, the physician will tell her, give 10 gram of, or let's say one gram of vancomycin. So she will record it. Then the second nurse will read back. Okay, we will give vancomycin one gram every eight hours. So it's a read back in the telephone order, not repeat back. So you should read what's written or what's entered in the system. And if there is like more than one digit, you should say, for example, one, five not 15 because uh, uh, she might uh, hear it or read it as 50 or uh, the physician hear it as uh, 50. So um, the read back procedure is first nurse will record, second nurse will read back and she should spell out the numbers. Okay and it is not allowed in some situations like chemotherapy agent, parental nutrition initiation. Sorry you should be uh, um, uh, yeah, in chemotherapy agent, uh, agent, either initiation or continuation, parenteral nutrition, initiation or continuation, you should not take any telephone order. But in case of epidural, patient control analgesia, parenteral pressors, parenteral skeletal muscle area license, we should not take it as initiation, but continuation is okay. Okay. Move, Michael. So. So uh, this is a quotation from uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Lucian Lee. Uh, human beings are uh, make mistakes. All of us we can make uh, we uh, make mistakes because of the system. When you when you will come here in the hospital and when you will work, you will find out. You come to the hospital to help the patient, 
but you find out that you did a mistake. It's not intentionally, it's due to the system. So tasks and processes, uh, they work and are poorly designed. Unfortunately, when you will come, you will see how is the system is poorly designed. We are trying our best to have the best um, design, but still we don't reach up to the uh, perfection. So humans are imperfect. Uh, accept that errors will occur and focus on the system, not on the people. So mainly the system, and I don't mean the system health informatics system. The system is the medication use process system. If you have any question, uh, Mike next. If you have any question, you can type it before we move to the next presentation. I'll give you one minute. The next presentation will be um, Michael. I will share the presentation, Mr. Iyad here. I will share the Lhasa now in the screen. OK. OK, let me try. Uh, this is high alert. This is. This is Lhasa. Do you see it, Michael? Yes. Clear? Uh, guys, do you see the presentation? Okay, let me turn on my... Uh... Okay. طبعاً أنا ما تطلعش معايا في ال هاي اللاسا إذا يقول مو from one slide to another. Is it working? Yeah. Michael, do you hear a Mr. Iyad? Yes. Hi Mike. Hi everybody. Good afternoon. Hello. Michael. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. To use, Can you start? Uh, use this mic or? No, 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 on the side of the It's clear, yeah. Okay. 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 Shall we close the door? Or it's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Please update me that everybody is okay with the voice. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to apologize for this technical issue, uh, but hopefully we will manage it uh, as possible. My name is Iyad Farah. I will be uh, talking to you about some of the uh, main sources of medication errors. Uh, the first main source is the look-alike, sound-alike, and then the error-prone abbreviations. We're going to overview the definition of look-alike, sound-alike, the LASA. What do we mean by LASA? Uh, to improve the awareness of LASA drugs, to share some of our experiences and some of the international experiences on LASA. Uh, then we'll go to the other part of the sources of medication errors, which is the error-prone abbreviations. Uh, what do we mean by that? And what strategies uh, we implemented to minimize the risk of error-prone abbreviations? and to improve our practice. What do we mean by look-alike medications? I'll start with this example, a case scenario that happened in ER several years ago, where a patient presented with severe hypoglycemia. So what will be your medication of choice? I don't know if you can interact with me. Uh, they, they can interact. Um, okay, so what is the treatment of choice for severe hypoglycemia? I'm sure everybody will choose dextrose 50%, right? And that was that was uh, that what was selected that time to give the patient dextrose 50% IV. The near spec up the vial of dextrose 50% and inject it to the patient. Suddenly the patient collapsed, having severe or had severe arrhythmia and arrested. Later on, we discovered that 
the vial that we used was not the dextrose 50%. It was something exactly look like the dextrose 50, but it was unfortunately magnesium sulfate 50%. So as you see here in this slide, the package of the magnesium sulfate exactly or, or, or almost looks like the dextrose 50%. So later on, we'll see what strategies we implemented after that to prevent such fatal error to happen. On the other hand, what do we mean by the sound alike? Sound alike refers to drug names, which due to their pronunciation may sound similar to other drugs. So the pronunciation is similar, which confusing the healthcare providers and creates error. A famous example of that is the Omprazole. Once it was launched in the 1980s by the Merck company, they gave it a trade name, Losek. At that time, Losek was a new name, so most healthcare providers are familiar with some sound alike drug, which is Lasix. So whenever they prescribe it in the handwriting at that time, so the pharmacist or the healthcare provider will misread it as Lasix. So imagine if you give a patient a diuretic instead of something for his stomach pain for some time, several days or weeks or months maybe, what dehydration will result, the electrolyte imbalance and all these complications and some of them resulted in death. So the company after that decided to change the trade name instead of Losek to Prelosec. Again, Prelosec was mixed up with a common drug that time, a famous drug, which was Prozac. So whatever trade name you will select, you may find something sounds alike to it. Another famous example is the mixing up between morphine and hydromorphone, resulting in respiratory arrest and death and many other examples of the sound alike. You know many of them. One interesting example uh, is a case of a patient with psychiatric illness, history of psychiatric illness on antipsychotic medication, admitted for some medical reason, and he's been using chlorpromazine for some time, and he knows his medication very well. So the nurse brought his chlorpromazine tablet telling him this is your medication as usual. The patient knows his medication very well, so he said this is not my tablet. I know my chlorpromazine tablet very well. The nurse showed that she is very confident and she's sure that this is your tablet. Don't worry, but this is from a different, pharma, a different manufacturer. Finally, the patient said for sure, since the nurse is confident, so he took that tablet and resulted in severe hypoglycemia and anoxic brain damage as well. Okay, I am back. So back to this example. So the patient received instead of chlorpromazine, the antipsychotic medication that he's been using, he received something sound alike, which is chlorpromide, which is a hypoglycemic agent resulting in severe hypoglycemia. Everybody is OK with the voice? Mike, everybody hears me well? Just reassure me that everybody. Yes, we can hear you well. perfectly. OK. Another source of medication errors is the packaging of the medication. Um, many manufacturers, they produce their packages with the same colors, same uh, uh, backing. So this creates a lot of confusion to healthcare providers and for patients as well. So later on, we'll see how can we ask the manufacturers to redesign their packages. So again, uh, the strategies we implemented here to minimize the risk of the sound alike, look alike or look alike sound alike, the LASA. First of all, to enhance the awareness of LASA, and that's what we are doing right now. That's why our organization developed the APP 1429-02. You can access this LASA uh, APP in the one-stop resource. Explains all the possibilities that we may face in this regard. 
a lot of recommendations we have to follow, such as the complete prescription. We need the dose, the strength, the indication as well. Somebody may ask, why do you need the indication on the prescription? Now, I'll give you an example of the importance of the indication, and that's what happened in our pharmacy. A patient was prescribed metalazone, or sorry, methamazole, and the diagnosis is congestive heart failure. So the pharmacy, the smart pharmacist, checked the medication. It's a new drug, which is methamazole, and the diagnosis is congestive heart failure. So she called the physician, the prescriber, asking, dear doctor, are you sure you want to give methamazole for this patient? Do you mean methamazole or something else? Then the doctor corrected his mis um, prescription. Oh, sorry, we mean metalazone. So that's another sound alike drug. If the, the smart pharmacist didn't pay attention to the diagnosis, we would give this patient uh, a very inappropriate medication for his case. Uh, the implementation of the computerized prescriber order entry, the CBOE. Several studies locally and internationally proved that implementing the CBOE systems will improve or reduce significantly the chance of medication errors. Restricting the verbal and telephonic orders to be permitted only in certain conditions, which is the emergent or urgent situations. So it's not very open or it's not open for anybody to prescribe by telephone without any strong emergent or urgent reason. The use of generic names is another source that we can uh, prevent the LASA by using the uh, generic name rather than trade name. The appropriate medication segregation. So um, the sound alike look alike drugs or the LASA segregated on different shelves. So if you have like, let's say, um, the previous example, magnesium sulfate and dextrose 50%. Although we don't have this concentrated electrolytes anymore, this is another, another uh, uh, strategy that we implemented. We're supposed to segregate it in two different shelves. So the chance of picking the wrong uh, vial or the wrong lookalike medication will be much less. Uh, and another important strategy we implemented is the use of tall man lettering. And what do we mean by tall man lettering? Uh, we'll go through that in a few minutes. When we talk about purchasing for safety, you remember the first example when we said that the magnesium sulfate was used inappropriately and mixed up with the lookalike dextrose 50. When we purchased from a different company with a different packing, different colors. So do you believe here, if you look at this uh, picture, is there any chance that you pick the magnesium sulfate 50% instead of dextrose 50%? The only similarity here is the 50%. And even the 50% here is in totally different color. So this is one of the important strategies is purchasing for safety. Another strategy is adding auxiliary labels. So that's what we have now. If we have a high, a high alert medication, we label it in red. And also, we have another strategy for that, which is reducing the cluttering. As you see here on the first um, packing of this medication, we have all the details, the drug name, the tablets, then the company address, the telephone number, the batch number. Do you need all this information while you deal with the patient, especially in an emergency situation with all these latent failures? Of course, we don't need all that. So all what we need to know is the drug name, the form, the dose, that's all. If I need the detail, I'll go inside the packet and look for these details. So this is again arrangement with the manufacturers to minimize these unnecessary clutters. Improving readability by the tall man lettering, and this is very important strategy. What do you mean by tall man lettering? If you have two lookalike sound alike drugs like dopamine and dobutamine, so the chance of mixing up between dopamine and dobutamine will be high, especially in emergency situation. 
don't think of it as if you are relaxed and you can read all the letters carefully and easily. If you are in an emergency situation under all that pressure, the workload, the stressful environment, working several nights in a row, all this will put you in a situation that you easily mix up between such lookalikes and alike drugs. So what we added here is the tall man lettering, the part of the word that sound alike, we've hidden it. We wrote it in a lower case. So Amin and Amin here, which likes each other, which looks alike, we've hidden it in a lower case. While the part of the word that looks different and easy to pick up, we wrote it in upper case. So here you can see dopiot in upper case. Easily you can differentiate it from dopa on the other hand. While the sound alike part or look alike part is written and hidden in a lower case format. Uh, in a chat? Okay. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you. But no voice, huh? You cannot hear them, right? Okay, excellent, excellent. Thank you for your chat. Uh, please keep writing to know that you're with me. Thank you. Okay. Another strategy again with the manufacturer is the color differentiation. We used to see several drugs with similar packing and more confusing to patients as well. If you have these medication with the same packing with different doses, an example of that is isokit with different doses before they used to bring it to us with same packing this is confusing for patients easy to mix up between different doses and confusing for healthcare providers as well redesigning the package as i said also to have the most info important information obvious for everybody from three non-opposing faces what do you mean by that Wherever, from wherever you look at the shelf of medication, you can see that medication, the most important information you need. All what you need, as I said, is the generic name of that drug, the form, and the dose. We don't need more details initially. When we talk about trademark suffixes, this is confusing for many healthcare providers. What do you mean by trademark suffixes like the SR, long acting, uh, extended release, modified release. The confusion comes with the new products. If you have a new product with this suffix, we will become confused with it because we assume that long acting means that we we're supposed to give it once daily. Modified release, we're supposed to give it mainly once daily, but this is not the case with all suffixes. That's why with any new product with suffixes, we it's highly recommended that you read the details of that product and the recommendation, how to prescribe it and how to administer it before you decide based on your memory of the previous suffixes on other medication. Uh, when we talk about the CBOE, um, Maybe we have it on the other slide. OK, uh, these are some of the sound alike, look alike medication. Uh, it's been listed by the uh, medication safety. And it has a standardized label, so you can easily see these look alike, sound alike medication. And also you will see the tall man lettering implemented. And if we have in maybe in the other slide, when we talk about safeguard or medication, uh, errors, we will see this tall man lettering implementation on the CBOE system, how to pick the correct medication without mixing up with a sound alike or look alike sound alike drug. Now let's talk about the other source of medication, error, which is the error prone abbreviations, symbols and those designations. What do we mean by error prone abbreviations? Uh, as you see in this um, nice image the husband is telling his wife i don't understand a word young people say these days and actually uh, i suffer this a lot when i see these abbreviations most of the time i don't understand c u i l t x t u l t r i'm sure most of you understand this and very 
um, very, very uh, familiar with it. But imagine if you implement such abbreviations with medical management, with medication. Do you believe this is safe to implement it? Like um, furosemide uh, OPD. And you assume that this OPD will be familiar with everybody. So you put your abbreviation, you share it with your colleagues, and you made it as a standard. Thank you very much. And you make it as a standard abbreviation for you. This is not acceptable in healthcare management, especially with medication management. So error-prone abbreviations, symbols, and those designations refer to abbreviation symbol, those designations that have been shown to cause errors and compromises patient safety. Orders that are eligible or contain oral prone abbreviations will not be carried out. So wherever you are in the pharmacy, uh, in the unit, and you saw such uh, ineligible oral prone abbreviation, you have the right to return back this request or order from the clinician and to correct it before you implement it to the patient. The reason for that is patient safety. Even if it, if it will cause some delay, but Patient safety, as everybody agrees, is our priority. These are some of the error prone abbreviations, symbols, and those designations that we need to avoid and write it in the acceptable way. An example on that is the MG for microgram, mu G. So we are not allowed to write mu G for microgram. You're supposed to write either microgram as a whole or MCG. What do you think about CC? Everybody knows that CC is ML, right? So why it's prohibited? Because easily, under the stressful situations that we mentioned, under the difficulty of vision, not everybody has the same uh, quality of vision to see these Cs easily. So easily this can be confused with zeros, with any other uh, meaning. So you need to write it or we need to write it as ml or milliliter dc also have many different meanings so don't assume that people understands what you uh, mean so either you write this is a discontinue or discharge or any other meaning you have in your mind hs has the same also don't assume that everybody believe understand that hs is half strength it might be have strength in this situation. In another situation, it may have another meaning. So write it as a whole exactly what you mean. ODQD, this is prohibited. And unfortunately, many practitioners, many healthcare workers, they still use it. So please remind them again, avoid this prohibited abbreviation to prevent any possible medication errors. So write exactly what you mean with that. QD, QID, what do you mean? Once daily, four times a day. QHS, what do you mean with that? Subcut, again, it might be confused with anything, with numbers, with meanings, so write exactly what you mean. Subcut or subcutaneously. Unit, write it as a whole unit. Don't write you because easily, again, can be mixed up with any other meaning. All medication, this is uh, our rule in management of medication. Any medication should not be written in abbreviation way. So AZT, maybe somebody who's familiar with AZT as azathioprine, but maybe you'll have a new drug have the same uh, letters as Trionam, maybe new product that I'm not familiar with. Nitro, somebody will claim that nitro is well known in CCU as nitroglycerin. So why I'm not allowed to say nitro? Because we have many other drugs. Initially, we have nitroglycerin also very commonly used in ICUs, but you may find another product that, again, you're not updated about. So everybody, I think, now agrees with me that using abbreviation may save minutes. That's true, but prohibiting such abbreviations definitely may save lives. I hope I covered this, uh, these two sources of medication errors in a uh, brief and nice way. Do you have any question on this part of uh, our talk? Please write in the chat if you have any question. Uh -huh. there is no okay, shall I write here? 
Okay, do you have any question about the LASA and error bond abbreviations? Okay, shall we proceed with our talk to the next topic? Safeguard now, sir. Mm, yeah, sir. Safe. Mm. Uh -huh, thank you. Yeah. It's clear. Thank you very much. Ah, very good. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Anonymous. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Anonymous. 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 Can I come. I'm um, at home. It seems to be working for me at home. So inshallah, this uh, this this will work. Excellent, excellent. So now uh, Mr. Iyad will present the safeguard. Uh, then I will uh, do proceed for the next two presentations. Then uh, your turn. Okay. So please mute Dr. Siraj until uh, we finish. Unless you have any question, you can send it to me by WhatsApp. They had break or no yeah, breaks here, right? Yeah. We'll continue. OK, now we'll continue with the next topic. Uh, we are going to talk about how to safeguard and prevent the medication errors. We've learned some of the strategies to prevent medication errors. So now how to maintain it and ensure that we are implementing it in a nice way. So we are going to review the best error prevention tools what we call it the hierarchy of effectiveness. We'll explain the role of different types of medication safety technologies. We'll emphasize on the advantages of smart pump technology, uh, the different methodologies used to minimize consequences of errors. Uh, we'll review the medication reconciliation process. What do we mean by that? And then we'll discuss the importance and the impact uh, of patient education on preventing medication errors. Okay. Um, how are we going to select the best strategy to, to implement to prevent medication errors? We have different tools to implement. These tools ranges from very effective down to the least effective. Let's start from down. The least effective, such as telling people, uh, please be careful please take care. Um, so this is good, but do you believe this is eff effective way? This is the least effective way. We need to do it, yeah, but you need to support it with many other strategies to ensure the implementation of this, of these strategies. So after reminding people, be careful, don't make mistake. This is Im very important to prevent uh, fatal consequences and, si and complications to the patients we move to the next step, which is the education and access information. And that's what we are doing now. We educate the healthcare providers on a regular basis about the importance of preventing medication errors and make the information easily accessible to them. So wherever or whenever you need any information about medication safety, you get it easily. Again, this is not enough. This is preparatory strategies. We need to put clear rules and strategy and, and policies. And that's what we have with our APPs, our protocols, our guidelines. It is well established. But having all these rules and policies, all this education, all these reminders without more practical steps, it might not be effective enough. So you need something else, which is reminders, that's why we have cards. If you have any question about the cross sensitivity, you have it in front of you in the office, in the, in the pharmacy, in the clinic. So if you want to prescribe antibiotic, you have a reminder on your board. Can I give this 
uh, azithromycin for somebody who's allergic to penicillin? Can I give this cephalosporin for somebody who's allergic? Uh, redundancies, checklist is very important. This patient is having um, maybe ischemic heart disease. When I have a checklist, this patient is on antiplatelets. He's on one antiplatelet or two antiplatelets. Why anti on two antiplatelets? Uh, is he on statin or not on statin? Why he's not on statin? So all these checklists would remind us, the healthcare providers, the clinician, the pharmacist, that this patient is using the evidence-based or guidelines-directed medical therapy, yes or no, whether we need to continue with it or we need to remind the clinician, oh, doctor, this patient is having PCI and he's not on statin. Did you forget to renew it or you mean it? So this is a very good collaboration between the different uh, multidisciplinary team healthcare providers to ensure the patient is getting the best and optimum care. More effective than that is the simplification and standardization. And we will have some examples on that. On top of that, the automation and computerization, and that's what we'll have, what we have with the CPOE system, computerized prescriber order entry system, uh, and many other electronic systems that we will overview in a minute. And the highest level of effectiveness in the hierarchy is the forcing function and constraints. You cannot proceed a step further without uh, uh, implementing the step by force. You cannot give this medication because the computer doesn't allow you. Based on these results, this patient cannot take this medication. Based on allergy of this medication, I cannot proceed with my order or my um, administration. Okay, so now we'll start with the highest level of effectiveness, forcing function and constraints. An example of that, as I said, is the allergy status. In the old system, although we started the CBOA system several years ago, but initially we had some problem with it. It doesn't have the force function appropriately. So the prescriber was able to uh, uh, bypass the, the force function or the restraints about allergy. Although the patient had allergy to this medication, but the physician was able by a simple click to overcome that allergy alert without reading the, the alert appropriately. And that's a case actually happened several years ago before implementing the development on our CBU system and implementing this forcing function and constraints. Uh, a patient who is known to be allergic to uh, ciftriaxone uh, admitted again, although it was documented in the uh, medical file, electronic medical file, that this patient is allergic to ciftriaxone, the physician decided to prescribe it. He missed that comment. The system alerted us that this patient is allergic, but because of the maybe the load of the work, because of any other factors, the physician just kept clicking and easily skipped that alert. So the order went through to the pharmacy. The pharmacist, the pharmacist had the same issue, so that alert, but under certain situation, maybe several patients are waiting in front of the pharmacist, or many other factors, didn't pay attention to that alert and just clicked a simple click and bypassed that allergy alert. So now the order went to the nurse. For that unlucky lady, the uh, nurse missed this allergy status and by mistake was written that this patient has no allergy, no known allergy at the head of the bed. So the medication was administered to the patient and developed severe anaphylaxis. Once we implemented this forcing function, it's not easy now for the clinician to proceed with the order and cannot skip this allergy easily. They, they need to write a text. Why do you want to continue with this medication? The same thing with the pharmacy. It's not just a simple click that you can skip this alert. Another example on forcing function and constraints, the two types of syringes, the oral syringes and the lurloxilip. 
an incident happened long time ago that IV medication, uh, sorry, oral medication was given uh, through IV line. So at that time, the same syringe was compatible with the IV line. So whatever you have, any syringe, you can hook it, connect it to the IV line and administer. So what was the intervention since that time? That oral medication has special syringe with this red or orange color, and even the top of it doesn't fit the IV line. That's why we have this lure look syringe that you have to switch it and fit appropriately in the IV line. By this, you prevent such mistake by forcing function. It's not only by education, not only by uh, policies and procedure, also by force. Even if I am not concentrating for any reason, I cannot make this mistake. No way I can do it. Uh, another force function is the concentrated electrolytes and paralyzing agent adding a constraint. Uh, so all these very high risk medication are put in uh, a red container with lead, it's covered. On top of that now, you cannot find these agents easily in the units. So it's been pulled out of the units, only certain areas OR and very few areas that have such agents. So the chance of making mistakes with these concentrated electrolytes are much less. The second level of effectiveness after these force function is the automation and computerization. And as I mentioned, once we implemented the CBOE system, it's been proved that the medication errors have been declined significantly. And even the CBOE system, it has some additions on it. Uh, maybe you'll see it with uh, other presentations. Uh, you can easily select among the list of medications that has the look-alike, sound-alike, it has the tall man lettering in it. It has enough spacing in it. So CBOE together with um, strategies to minimize the chance of error between the LASA drugs, as well as the force function, all implemented together uh, to prevent the medication errors. Another examples of example of automation and computerization is the ADCs, the automated dispensing cabinet. And what we use here is the Omnicell. So you are using the barcode. Electronically, you check the um, MRN, the details, the identifier of the patient. You compare it with the barcode on the medication. So, so the human error here is much less. Another example of automation and computerization, as I said, the point of care barcoding. So you check the barcode of the medication. You compare it with the barcode of the patient uh, to see the, if that exactly what's been prescribed to the patient. If not, you cannot proceed with uh, your uh, procedure. Uh, the smart pumps are an excellent way to prevent medication error, especially if you use the medication library. Uh, so you cannot proceed with the medication with the wrong dose because you are restricted with certain limits. So you have a limit for this drug. If you selected, let's say, dopamine by using the drug library, you cannot exceed certain dose on this bump. Unlike if you connect it to a bump without this medication library and this restriction. So at that time, you may give instead of 20 mics, which is could be the maximum dose of dopamine, you may give 200 mics and nobody can stop you. But here, by implementing this automation, as well as force function on the pump itself, because it has an upper limit, so you cannot exceed it. After that, you will have the simplification and standardization as uh, uh, an effective strategy, although it is less effective than the other two strategies, but it adds a lot to prevent medication errors. And that's what we have when we standardize the medication labels. So. Before we used to have to do our own labels, each unit, ICU will prepare their own label, warfarin, um, potassium, dopamine, and we put it on our medication uh, vial or medication uh, uh, mini bag. Now, if you 
go to the one stop resource, you will find all these standardized medication labels and you can get it from anywhere in the hospital. Also, the safe labeling of syringes. So all syringes as recommended by the JCI and by the uh, medication safety uh, bodies should be immediately labeled if not used. And there are some instructions about that, like the JCI note in the medication management chapter. Medications drawn up not administered immediately should be consistently labeled with patient name, MRN, medication name, dosage and concentration, the date you prepared it, and the BUD. So if exceeded this BUD date, the beyond use date, it should not be used. Are you okay with me? Okay, so now the next uh, level of effectiveness is using the reminders, redundancies, checklist, and double check. One of these reminders is the high alert medication. Uh, we use the color, the high alert color, red color, and the word. So if we have, for example, anticoagulant, it will have a high alert medication label reminding us that this is high alert, be careful, or paralyzing agent causing respiratory arrest, patient must be ventilated. So this is another reminder that be careful, you cannot use this medication for any patient. The checklist, as I mentioned with the heart failure example, for, for example, or the atherosclerosis patient, where they need to be on certain medication by checking this checklist. Also the chemotherapy checklist. So this patient is on chemotherapy, uh, all information, uh, verified correctly, the right volume have been uh, prepared. So these checklists and reminders will uh, keep us alert and following the highest level of precaution before we administer a medication uh, for a patient. After that, less effective strategy is the rules and policies. When I say less effective, doesn't mean that it's not necessary. It is necessary, but by itself doesn't mean anything. It means the first step that you put, which is important step, but you cannot put a well-established rules, policies and procedures without uh, uh, showing people and helping people to implement it. Some organizations may have an excellent rules and policies. But the implementation, there is a big gap between these policies, guidelines, and between the implementation. So here is the role of the administration is to, 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 uh, to cover this gap between the theory, the rules, policies, and procedures, and the uh, correct implementation of it. Less effective way or at the lowest level on the hierarchy is the staff education and access to information. And luckily we have an excellent resource, which is the one stop resource. And I am sure now everybody can access it. If you go to the home page of the intranet, you go down to the medical link, you will find a one stop resource. Anything you need to know about medication safety, you will find it there. Policies, procedures, standardized medication labels, drug formulary, micromedics, uh, the course details, all these are available and many other educational sources. This is the one stop resource that I just talked about. And the first thing to start with is just reminding people that you are responsible and accountable for your acts and omissions. So you need to be careful, you need to be vigilant. But as we agreed, this is not enough. You need to support them with education, policy procedures and strategies especially computerization and digitalization to help them uh, implement that. So how to select among these strategies from the highest level? As we mentioned, the forcing function and constraints, you cannot proceed without doing this, down to the reminding by uh, wording. So you have to decide where are you. If you're just starting in a center that has nothing of these, you cannot go to the force function immediately. So you need to start with educating people, establishing uh, good rules and policies, um, uh, prepare reminders and checklists, 
prepare your automation and computerization system and adding the forcing function on it. The faster you have all these together, the better. But you decide depends on the resources in your organization. Um, before we had very, you remember the technology before, I'm sure none of you saw this TV before, majority of you. Um, none of you saw the black and white TV, but now we have all these screens. We have the treadmill. Everybody has a gym in their house, but the outcome as you see here. So it's not about the availability of technology. It's about how to use the technology. When we talk about the smart pump technology, we have it. Uh, it's an excellent computerized system. But if we don't use the smart pump drug library, we are not utilizing the technology properly. As if you have a screen full HD, LED, what you call it, the 4K, all these, but you don't know how to use it. Or you open, uh, you're watching an old movie uh, in black and white. So it doesn't have any 4K uh, features or anything. So here you need to add the smart pump uh, features, which is the hard limit stop and soft limit override in the drug library. What do we mean by soft limit override? Soft limit allows you to bypass this limit, like uh, maximum dose for this drug is 12, um, uh, 12 mils per hour. For some reason, the uh, intensive decided to make it 14 units. So here you can skip this mild difference and go to the higher dose, higher limit. But if the limit is very high, so this is a hard limit to stop, so you cannot exceed it. So you need to go back to the allowed limit uh, of the uh, drug library. So this is again under what uh, strategies when we have this hard limit? Try to answer. So the hard limit is stop in the drug library, in the pump. Is it computerization? Is it force function? Is it uh, reminders, checklist? What do you think? OK, now you can hear me. Do you hear me now? Sorry, I just saw this message now. Again, do you hear me? So I can repeat if you didn't hear me before. Do you hear me now? Shall I continue? Forcing function, excellent, yeah, you are right. So this hard limit to stop is the forcing function. Is the voice okay now? We can hear you, computerization. Okay, no, yeah, you are right, computerization. But on top of that, what do you have? It's a force function. Yes, no, yes, we can hear, yes. So some can hear, yes, others cannot. Okay, sorry for that, but I'll try to raise my voice for everybody. You are right. This is the computerization and force function. Minimize the consequences of errors. Uh, reduce the amount of floor stop. Like, for example, a clinic, general clinic, they don't have procedures. They don't have sick patients. They see only primary, uh, primary patients with diabetes, maybe hypertension. Do you need, uh, for example, high alert, let's say concentrated electrolytes in your floor stock, you don't need it. Do you need uh, heparin injection? Unlikely, you don't need it. You are not in inpatient area or in, or in ER. So you, you minimize the floor stock to the things that you use frequently. Let's say that you decided to put antihypertensive medication OK, full screen. Where's the full screen here? OK. 
So now we are on full screen. You can see it, Mike? Yes. OK. So minimize your uh, floor stock to the amount that you need it to your area. But if you selected to add, for example, antihypertensive and you spent one year or two years, never used it. So it makes sense that you return it unless it is something that is life saving and there is a chance that you need it at one day for life saving. Uh, stuck the lower concentration required for treatment, like you have heparin with different concentrations. We have heparin 5,000 and we have 25,000. So which is safer? Which is more safe to have the 25,000 vial? And if you take out one ml, so the concentration will be more. Or you have a 5,000 vial. So which causes more harm if we made a mistake? the vial with high concentration or the vial with less concentration? Of course, the vial with high concentration is more dangerous. That's why I try to keep the least concentration as possible. Always try to keep the availability of antidotes, especially for drugs that you use in your area. If you are in ICUs, you use Narcotics, you need to have the antidotes for that narcotic. If you're using anticoagulants, you need to have the antidote for the anticoagulants and so on. Availability of anaphylactic kits for adult and pediatric. This is now uh, common sense in our area, in our organization. Wherever you go, you will find anaphylactic kit, well prepared, and maybe in the allergy uh, presentation, we will show you how we developed our anaphylactic kit, very comprehensive, uh, standardized, straightforward to use for any healthcare provider. Just follow the instructions and implement it. Now let's talk about medication reconciliation. What do you mean by medication reconciliation? It is the process of comparing medications the patient is taking and should be taking with a newly ordered medication. So the patient admitted through ER, we need to have his old medication or her old medication, review it and compare it with our current medication. Do we need this aspirin? Yes, continue. Do we need this statin? Yes, continue. Do we need this Amlor? No, he's hypotensive, so hold. Do you need this warfarin? Yes, we need it or we don't need it. He has bleeding, hold. So these, this, what do we mean with the conciliation? The comparison addresses duplications, omissions, interactions, and the need to continue the current medication. The type of information that clinicians use to reconcile medications include, among others, medication name, dose, frequency, route, and purpose. The patient was using a high dose of, let's say, 10 milligrams of warfarin. In the reconciliation process, you compare it with the INR. Today's INR is five. It's very high. So are we going to continue the 10 milligrams? No, we will hold it or we will reduce it. We will make a decision based on our current situation. More than 40% of medication errors occur during admission, transfer, and discharge. And this is the time we need to do the reconciliation to prevent the medication errors. After implementing the medication reconciliation, physician has reduced the medication prescribing errors by 70 to 80 percent. This is a study published in 2003 in the Quality Management Healthcare. And the pharmacist has reduced time clarified physician orders and outpatient prescriptions because already the physician has clarified this and reconciled and gave you in the pharmacy uh, a cleared list of medication after this reconciliation. Nurses reduce the time spent on medication history and counseling, reduce the medication administration errors by 45 to 65 percent. So overall, we improve the patient safety, reduce the patient adverse events by 15 to 30 percent. So it's really very important process to implement. 
this is the process of medication reconciliation in our CBOE system. So you have the admission order and you have the history of medication. So you compare, do you need the furosemide? No, we don't need it. The patient is dehydrated. He has electrolyte imbalance. So you will not renew it now. You will keep it on hold. Do you need this um, nifedipine? No, we don't need it now. Keep it on hold. The patient is hypotensive. So keep it on hold for today. So by this, you clear the list for the most important medication that the patient need. And this is the final list that you selected among the list of the previous list of medication. Uh, education of uh, patient and caregiver is very important. You may handle patients who are unable to take care of themselves. And many times they come with their sitters who are taking care of them. So you need to start their education for both patient and family. Initiate at the time of the prescription. So if it's in the clinic, the physician supposed to prescribe to the doctor, to the patient and the nurse, and sorry, the family, why we prescribe this medication. What is the purpose? Then the pharmacist will continue with the education of the patient and the family about this drug, the name, the purpose, the dose, the side effect, when to use it, what interactions uh, are possible. And give the chance to patient and family to ask questions, and we expect questions from them, and we're supposed to answer them. Listen to what the patient is saying, and, uh, and he is the last independent double check. And this is very important, and there is an example. Uh, we always mention it. We already mentioned the patient who received the anti-diabetic medication instead of the antipsychotic medication. Although the patient mentioned that this is not his medication that he used to take, the nurse insisted that this is the medication, don't worry. So please remember whenever a patient or a family member stopped you and asked you to check, just retreat and think for 10 seconds, review what the patient or the family is saying. By this delay, you may save the life of the patient rather than making a uh, fatal medication mistake. Why do we need to educate patients and families? Uh, he will operate it. Uh, what if you have an educated person? You have a doctor coming to the pharmacy to collect his prescription. Are you going to educate him or not? Why do we need to educate a doctor about medication? We'll see. This is a doctor. Let's say uh, it can't be a doctor. Huh? This lady can't be a doctor. <laughs> no way. But I, what I mean, and you will decide after uh, viewing this video, any person who's coming to you, even if he's well educated, you need to educate him for the basis. Let's listen to this video. Mike, do you hear me? Can you play the video? Mike? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, please play the video. One moment. Later, I'm not sure. I know the first time you have this difficulty. I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to ask you. Can be sold, and the problem can be sold. Yeah. Mark? Uh, yes. Uh, it's not yet played, huh? Not yet. Thanks, Namalek. Shukran. Do you have any question until the video is working? You can write yes, it in no. the chat while we're listening. Yes, Mike, go ahead. Can't hear Mike. Repeat it, please. We cannot hear your mic. I'm not sure if the audience, they can hear it. Can you repeat it, Mike, please, with the voice? 
I'm not sure if you heard the voice, but I'm sure you understand the story. So this lady looks an educated lady. And she kept complaining of her bronchial asthma exacerbation, although she's using the inhalers. So we don't need to educate her, right? Because she's, she looks well educated. But when we ask her, well, how are you using the inhaler? You saw how she used it. That's why we consider any patient as I'm not somebody who needs our information and education. Do you have any question? We cannot hear you again, okay. Do you hear me now? Do you have any question? Do you miss anything of the last slides? Yes, we understand. I am sure you understand. Inshallah. Thank you for your cooperation with us with this technical difficulty. Do you have any question before we proceed to the next topic? Okay, thank you very much. Any question? Rada will reply. We'll proceed. Again, uh, yes, we understand. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So you don't have any questions. We can proceed to the next lecture. Um, and let me share the lecture with you. <laughs> Welcome anytime.